everyone and welcome to Arirang News. I'm Nahyun Gyeong in Seoul. The news we're tracking for you at this hour. The world is shocked by a video that shows Islamic State militants burning a Jordanian pilot in a cage. In response, Jordan executes a prisoner whose release was sought by the militants. The defense ministers of South Korea and China sit down for talks this afternoon. The two are expected to discuss nuclear and military threats from North Korea. And speaking of North Korea, Pyongyang makes it official that the regime does not want to engage in dialogue with Washington. Referring to President Obama's recent remarks about the regime, North Korea says there will be counteraction. But first, the most horrid act of murder yet by the Islamic State militants, the extremist group released a video on Tuesday showing a caged Jordanian pilot being burned to death. Officials in Jordan have vowed revenge. Connie Lee reports. Jordan has vowed punishment and revenge against Islamic State militants for the horrifically brutal death of pilot Muhath al Qasasbe. Jordan's King Abdullah, who briefly met with President Barack Obama at the White House Tuesday night, cut his U.S. trip short after hearing news of the murder. In a statement, King Abdullah hailed the pilot as a hero and called the terrorists cowardly. We meet today with the great grief, despair, and anger following the death as a martyr of the heroic pilot Muaf al Kasaspe by the hands of the coward terrorists that behaved in an extremely wrong, criminal, and prejudicial manner that has nothing to do with Islam. According to security officials in Jordan, some IS linked militants jailed there will be executed in response at dawn on Wednesday, Jordanian time. This includes Sajida al Rishawi, the Iraqi woman who was offered up as a prisoner swap for the pilot. All this comes after the Islamic State released an extremely graphic video on Tuesday, which purportedly shows the pilot being burned alive inside a cage. As the authenticity of the video is being confirmed, President Obama called the militant group vicious and barbaric. Whatever ideology they're operating off of, uh, it's bankrupt. And this organization appears only interested in uh, death and destruction. In Jordan, citizens rallied in Karak, the hometown of the pilot, on Tuesday night to express their anger. I call on the government to execute Sajida al Rishawi and the ones related to the Islamic terrorists in the Jordanian prisons. 26 year old Al Qasasbe was captured in December when his jet crashed in Syria during a bombing mission against IS. He leaves behind a wife, parents, and a nation brimming with grief and fury. Connie Lee. Arirang News. And Jordan is now reported to have executed two prisoners, including the Iraqi female bomber who was demanded in a prisoner swap for the Jordanian pilot. According to security sources there, Sajida al Rishiwawi was hanged in response to the killing of the pilot hours after the militant group released the video of his gruesome death. Jordanian authorities say they also executed another senior Al Qaeda prisoner who was sentenced to death for plots to wage attacks against the country in the last decade. North Korea says there is no longer a need for the regime to hold talks with the United States. The latest statement out of Pyongyang comes a matter of days after its invitation to a top U.S. diplomat was rejected by Washington. Hwang Sung Hee has the details. North Korea has officially stated that it no longer intends to engage with the United States. In a statement released Wednesday, the National Defense Commission said the North Koreans are not willing to sit at the negotiating table with Washington when the latter seeks to bring it down. The commission, which is the regime's most powerful ruling body, is referring to a remark made by U.S. President Barack Obama in a recent YouTube interview. And it is very hard to sustain that kind of brutal uh, authoritarian regime uh, in this modern world. Over time, you will see a regime like this collapse. The commission went on to warn that the U.S. hostilities will be met with a just counteraction focused on inflicting the bitterest disasters upon the United States. North Korea may find itself cornered after the U.S. turned down a number of its offers. Pyongyang said last month that it was willing to suspend nuclear testing if joint military drills between the U.S. and South Korea were halted, an offer flatly rejected by Washington. North Korea invited Chief U.S. Envoy for North Korea Policy Sang Kim to Pyongyang last week, 
only to be turned down again. While the regime blames Washington for the current deadlock in dialogue, the U.S. has continuously insisted it remains open to talks. It says the only condition for resuming dialogue is for the North to demonstrate a willingness to give up its nuclear ambitions. Hwang sang Arirang News. South Korea's defense minister Han Min-gu meets with his visiting Chinese counterpart Chang Wan-chan in a couple of minutes. As a matter of fact, the two are expected to discuss a wide array of issues, chief among them being the security situation surrounding the Korean Peninsula. For this report, here's our Kim Yun bin Chinese Defense Minister Chang Wan-chan is holding talks in Seoul with his South Korean counterpart Han Min-gu. Topping the agenda will be military and nuclear threats from Pyongyang and the current security situation on the peninsula. The defense ministry is also expected to call on China to put more pressure on Pyongyang to end its nuclear program. They will also discuss ways to further boost bilateral cooperation, including the establishment of a direct military hotline between the two ministers. The two countries have had hotlines between their navies and air forces since 2008 and have had discussions on setting one up for the defense ministers since 2007, but put it off as China was hesitant to risk its relations with North Korea. The communication channel is widely expected to enhance security on the Korean Peninsula and cooperation on North Korean threats as the ministers will have direct access to each other. Chang is the third Chinese defense minister to visit South Korea. The last visit of a Chinese defense minister to Seoul was in 2006. Chang is scheduled to return to Beijing on Thursday. Kim Yun-bin, Arirang News. The top nuclear envoys from South Korea and China, in the meantime, will meet in Beijing today for talks on efforts to denuclearize North Korea. Seoul's foreign ministry says Hwang Jun-guk and his Chinese counterpart Wu Dawei will be resuming where they left off last October. The two officials will not only discuss ways to prevent North Korea from further developing its nuclear weapons program, but also talk about the possibility of reviving the stalled six-party denuclearization talks last held in 2008. The meeting today follows trilateral talks in Tokyo last week among nuclear envoys from South Korea, the U.S., and Japan on bringing North Korea back to the six-party talks. North Korea is demanding the United Nations retract its resolution on the country's human rights record. Pyongyang's state-run Korean Central News Agency says North Korean Foreign Minister Ri Su-yong sent a letter to the UN asking it to revoke the adopted resolution, saying it's based on false information. North Korea has been demanding that its human rights record be expunged since last month when North Korean defector Shin dong yuk admitted that he had falsified parts of his story about his experiences in a prison camp. Lee has reportedly said Pyongyang is willing to talk about its human rights record when the UN withdraws its resolution. In the year 2012, Korea was at its record All of the day's important events, events close to home and around the world. Join Na Hyung Young, live from Seoul. Shopping market thinks the true meaning of creation shines through. In domestic politics, constitutional reform has been, has been mentioned here and there for a while now, but lawmakers haven't been able to initiate any real discussion because of political differences. But today, the opposition camp says it has set its own deadline to work towards bringing about reform. For more on this story, here's our Lee ji -yun. Let the public decide whether or not Korea needs an amended constitution. That's what the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy's floor leader, Woo yung gun plans to do next year. Let's form a special committee at the National Assembly this month to start rewriting the Constitution, whether it be a semi-presidential system or a parliamentary cabinet system, let's discuss all options. Then we should hold a national referendum on the amended Constitution during next year's April general elections. The opposition camp has been criticizing the president for exerting, quote, emperor-like power under the Constitution. 
It wants to revise the law to limit the president's power over nominating members of the cabinet and the constitutional court. The party is also pushing for a system in which the prime minister would take the administrative power, and such power would be guaranteed by the legal system, not by the president. However, the opposition camp's efforts to move forward with the issue faces a tough road ahead. For one, President Park Geun-hye refuses to discuss the issue. She says doing so would only shift the public's attention away from her economic initiatives, which she believes is a priority for the nation right now. The ruling party's new floor leader, Yoo Seung-min, also said Wednesday that they would need more time to discuss the issue because of contradicting views within the party. The current constitution was last revised in 1987 with the end of the country's military rule. Lee Ji-yoon, Arirang News. Meanwhile, at the nation's top office, President Park Geun-hye has asked the cabinet and staff to establish a smoother coordination with the presidential office. The president hopes the move will reassure the public that she is listening to their concerns. Choi Yoo-sun has this report. Amid a public backlash over the government's tax policy revisions and its suspension of reforms to the national health insurance program, President Park Geun-hye called for greater coordination between the cabinet and her office. 새로 신설이 되는 정책 조정 협의회를 통해서 청와대와 내각 간의 사전 협의와 조율도 강화해 나가기를 바랍니다. She emphasized that officials must clearly understand how a policy will affect the lives of the public through simulations and data analyses. Otherwise, she said its purpose will eventually be defeated. The president did not, however, respond to bipartisan calls for administration to decide between increasing taxes to add welfare benefits or scaling down on welfare to avoid raising taxes. Earlier on Tuesday, ruling party leader Kim Musang had heavily criticized President Park's election pledge to increase welfare without a tax hike. A recent poll showed 65 percent of Korean people thought it would be impossible to expand welfare without raising taxes. I agree with them, and it would be wrong for a politician to deceive the public by promising more welfare without raising taxes. Instead, Kim said the priority should be to review where the welfare budget is being spent and to seek ways to reduce expenses before opting to raise taxes. As for the government's backtracking on health insurance reforms, Kim vowed to initiate better communication between the party, government and presidential office. Choi yoo Sun, Arirang News. Korea's foreign exchange reserves dipped to their lowest level in eight months in January. The Bank of Korea says the reserves stood at around 362 billion U.S. dollars as of the end of last month, down almost one and a half billion dollars. The central bank attributes the fall to the weakening euro and British pound against the greenback. As of the end of December last year, Korea had the seventh largest foreign reserves in the world, following countries such as China, Japan, and Switzerland. Korea's cosmetic giant Amore Pacific posted record earnings last year, with the all-time high figure largely attributed to Chinese customers. But apparently, it's not just the Chinese tourists who are snapping up the company's products. Kim ji has this story. Korea's top cosmetics firm, Amore Pacific, which owned brands like Sorasu and Innisfree, recorded its best earnings last year. The firm's sales and operating profits jumped 25 percent and 52 percent to more than three and a half billion and 517 million U.S. dollars, respectively. The jump is due to the brand's popularity among the six million Chinese tourists estimated to have visited the country last year. The company's business operations overseas have also borne fruit, as sales in China increased 44 percent last year from the previous year. To cater to the rising demand there, the firm is launching its skincare brand Iope in the Chinese market this year. Meanwhile, its low-end brand Innisfree is expanding into other Asian countries, such as Singapore, Malaysia, and Taiwan, as well as the United States. Striking the iron while it's hot, Amore Pacific expects a sales increase of 13 percent this year to more than $4 billion, in addition to a 15 percent increase in operating profits this year from the previous year to $612 million. 
Amore Pacific's target stock price has been raised by 10 percent on Wednesday to nearly $3,000 by high investment in securities and Tombu Securities. Amore Pacific was founded in 1954 and is currently led by CEO Seo Kyung Bae. Last year, it merged with one of the country's largest distribution companies, CJGLS. Kim Jeon, Arirang News. Now, if you ever wondered what the best-selling compact hatchback car in Korea was last year, we have an answer today. It's Volkswagen's Golf. Industry insiders say this is significant because it's the first time sales of an imported car outpaced those of a domestic one in a particular model group. Local auto industry sources say Volkswagen sold nearly 7,240 units of the Golf last year, up 24 percent from a year earlier, outstripping its main rival, the Hyundai i30, which posted record low sales of fewer than 6,700 units. Market watchers believe the latest trend is an indication of the growing popularity and availability of imported cars in Korea in recent years. Global oil prices have rebounded significantly this week, jumping nearly 20 percent in the space of just four days. But is this a sustainable turnaround or a blip before prices hit south again? Hwang Ji-hae reports. Global crude prices have risen every day for the last four days, with prices gaining 19 percent over the period. That marks the biggest advance since January 2009. U.S. benchmark Western Texas Intermediate crude prices hiked 7 percent on Tuesday to 53 U.S. dollars a barrel, while Brent oil finished up almost 6 percent at around 58 dollars a barrel. The price gain came on the back of major energy companies announcing plans to streamline operations as a means to stem plummeting oil prices. BP made the latest move on Tuesday, saying it will slash spending on assets and investments by as much as $6 billion this year. So, are oil prices going to keep rising? CMC Markets' Michael Houston is skeptical, saying energy companies will might have to prepare for prices to drop again. It's going to have to keep a lid on costs. It's going to have to be very um, forensic in terms of future capital, you know, future cap capital expenditure, and, it, and it's going to have to get used to essentially a much, av a much lower average oil price over the next um, 18 months to two years. Traders also believe U.S. crude inventories will continue to rise while temporary factors like strikes at U.S. refineries affected the four-day rally in oil prices. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. A Korean man who was kidnapped by militants in the Philippines two weeks ago has been released and reunited with his family. Seoul's foreign ministry says the 55-year-old with the family name Yun is back at his home in the Philippines after his wife handed over an undisclosed amount of money to his abductors. While driving in Mindanao, the Philippines' easternmost island, Yun was abducted by armed militants who threatened to kill him if they were not paid a ransom. This is the latest kidnapping in the Philippines targeting Koreans. Last year, 10 Koreans were killed in the country. In what would be a first, UK lawmakers are on course to approve a controversial fertility procedure that would allow doctors to create babies using DNA from three separate individuals. Following 90 minutes of heated debate, MPs at the House of Commons passed a bill Tuesday and now it moves on to the House of Lords. UK Health Minister Jane Allison called the measure a bold but a considered and informed step. But Critics say it would enable doctors to cross a fundamental ethical boundary and potentially be a step closer to creating designer babies. The three-parent in vitro fertilization technique would combine DNA from a female donor with the DNA of mothers with mitochondrial deficiencies to help stop the genetic disease from being passed on to the child.
Today on our arts and culture segment, we are going to talk about a movie that's been adapted for the stage, The Hen Who Dreamed She Could Fly. If you remember, it's a children's story liked by many people here in Korea. Our Im Yoon Hee joins us today to tell us more. Hello, Yoon Hee. Hello. So the book was written by author Hwang Sun Mi, uh, and it was first published in 2002. And over the years, it became a huge success, becoming a bestseller, with an estimated 1.5 million copies printed and distributed to over 25 different countries. While that story has been translated into a musical form, take a look at this next report. Hwang Sun Mi's children's book, Madangul Naun Amtak, or The Hen Who Dreamed She Could Fly, is an award-winning bestseller. Since its publication in 2002, it's been translated into many different languages, reaching a global audience and taking on many different forms including a movie in 2011. Now the story of this little hen takes a stage in the form of a musical. When we talk about imagination, people often refer to what you see in movies. But this production is just as imaginative as anything you will see on screen. In the story, Leafy the hen wants to escape from her cage. She has dreams of living her own life, of marching to her own tune, and she wants to take her egg with her. The story is about freedom and individuality and persevering till the end. And though it's most popular with children, the production is not just for young viewers. From singing and dancing to valuable life lessons, the story of Leafy is something we can all relate to. The core of the story is similar to what people go through every day, so it has the potential to be a bestseller everywhere. Leafy so desperately wants to fly, but for this hen, it's all about the journey. And the movie, it came out just a few years ago. It was mm -hmm. a huge hit, wasn't it? Right. So the movie actually cast quite a few very popular voices, uh, one being Che min who became a huge hit last year after playing a part in the uh, Roaring Currents or Myeonglang, the movie that was a huge blockbuster hit. Uh, but the movie, uh, was the English title is called Leafy the Hen uh, Into the Wild. It actually brought in the highest number of ticket sales for any Korean animation at that time. Mm -hmm. But the story... Movie. Unlike uh, most of children's story, which has a happy ending, and right. this one has quite, kind of a sad ending. Mm -hmm. So author Huang has mentioned that she wrote this story uh, while her father unfortunately was on his deathbed. So she did include some of those ideas um, in her book, and she said she was a little bit worried about this book being translated into different languages. Mm -hmm. She didn't want that idea of accepting death and dealing with that um, to get lost in translation. So mm -hmm. a lot of people are enjoying this book, and this musical now is another great opportunity to go with your family and uh, enjoy maybe okay. this weekend so maybe <laughs> I will pick up the book in Korean mm -hmm. and then maybe Different we can forms. read it in English and see if it was lost in translation right. or not all right thank you very much Uni, for bringing us this report today you're very welcome <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Michelle Park here with the latest weather forecast. Today is Ipchun here in Korea, which means the beginning of spring. Now Koreans believe this day is the start of the year and hope for the best throughout the year. So I wish you all the best and hope you stay healthy. Now usually on this day we have freezing cold temperatures, but it looks like the mercury will stay above the seasonal average all across the nation. However, the air will feel a bit stiff, uh, stuffy due to the high levels of fine dust across the country. Now along with that, it's going to be a cloudy day here in the capital while there will be sporadic rain or snow falling on Chungcheong Namdu and the west coastal regions. Now let's go over to our readings for today. So it will peak up to 6 this afternoon while the southern cities such as Gwangju and Busan will top at 6 and 8 degrees. Now moving over to other regions, Jeju Island peaks up to 7, Tokdo hits down to 4, while Mount Kungang drops low chilly at negative 6 degrees. Well that's all for now, Michelle Park, and I hope you have a wonderful day. And that's the end of Arirang News at this hour. I'm Nai Hyun Gyeong. Thanks for watching.